Hi everybody. In the last video, I showed you a few cheap microphone options. But before we get back to talking cameras, let's look a little further up the budget scale. I've got six different microphones here, uh, each of which is credible in different circumstances. And as with the last video, we're concentrating mostly on their suitability for capturing interior dialogue because that can be a particular challenge. First, we've got the Audio-Technica AT4053B, a $600 hypercardioid mic popular among independent videographers. It has a frequency response of 20 Hz to 20 kHz and a respectable self-noise of 16 dB according to the specs. It is phantom powered only, has switches for both a high pass filter as well as a 10 dB pad. The 10 dB pad allows the mic to deal with uh, 155 decibels of sound pressure. That's roughly an F16 at takeoff. The 4053B capsule is interchangeable with other capsules. The uh, Cardioid 4051B, the Omnidirectional 4049B, sold separately. Next, we've got the Sennheiser K6 system, which is no stranger to the prosumer market. The K6 power module pairs with the ME60 series of microphone capsules, all of which have a frequency response of 40 Hz to 20 kHz. The K6 allows these mics to be powered by phantom or AA battery, and that allows you to take the output from the mic directly into a camera or other device that does not provide phantom power. It also has a high pass filter, but no pad. There are five capsules for the K6, and we have three represented here. The K6 sells for about $250, but is usually purchased as part of a kit with at least one capsule. At $170, the ME64 is a super lightweight cardioid capsule, which also claims uh, 16 dB of self-noise, but a bit more sensitivity than the Audio-Technica. It can handle sound pressure up to 130 dB, which is roughly the human threshold for pain. Arguably the most popular capsule is the $200 ME66 a short shotgun with the lowest self-noise of the bunch at 10 dB. It's also at least twice as sensitive as any other mic in this review, but can only handle sound pressure of 125 dB. Finally, we have the rarely mentioned ME65, and oddly, I can't find another video review of this capsule anywhere. This may very well be the first. It also isn't really fair to compare this mic with the others because it's designed as a vocalist mic to be handheld really close to the mouth and screamed into. Because of that, it has the lowest sensitivity of the bunch, almost half that of the Audio-Technica. But like the Audio-Technica, it is a hypercardioid mic. You could think of it as the AT4053B, but with the 10 decibel pad turned on all the time. We also have the Sennheiser MKH416 for comparison. The 416 is one of the best known professional short shotgun mics in the TV and film industries, making it an excellent touchstone for these kinds of comparisons. It is phantom powered only, has a response of 40 Hz to 20 kHz, a self noise of 13 dB, and can take 130 dB of pressure, has no high pass filter or pad. It's a thousand bucks, but sometimes you can find it on sale for somewhere between 30 and 50% off. Uh, check B&H come Black Friday. To round out the field, we have one of our cheap mics from the last video, the Lix Pro SDPC2, in this case sold as a pair for $100. Like the K6, it has interchangeable mic capsules, but like the Audio-Technica, the capsules only vary in their pickup pattern, whereas the K6 modules offer a much wider range of specialization. The frequency response is 30 Hz to 18 kHz, and it is a little noisy. So while I switch between the mics, let's talk about why people choose one or another for different scenarios. Note also that I only have one K6 module, so there will be a number of obvious cuts in the video as it has to be recorded three times, one for each capsule. Also, I'll start by saying that this is all being recorded into a Zoom F4 field recorder. The mics are positioned so that the condenser modules are all approximately 18 inches away. The shotguns will appear to be closer because their condensers are at the back of the interference tubes. I've tried to set the mic level so that they all peak around minus 12 dB, and I've normalized everything to minus 24 LUFS, which is the American broadcast standard for loudness. I'm recording in a modestly treated 10 by 12 room with a, with a window that, from an audio standpoint, acts more like a screen. Now, obviously, we're looking at a number of dissimilar mics. One difference is the pickup pattern of each, ranging from cardioid to hypercardioid, uh, but another is the difference between shotgun and non-shotgun. 
And that said, one piece of advice that every filmmaker eventually receives is that you shouldn't use a shotgun microphone for interior dialogue, that you should instead use a non-shotgun hypercardioid mic. The way it's usually explained is that in small echoey rooms, the interference tube at the front of a shotgun mic will create unexpected audio artifacts due to reflections entering the tube from the side. This is technically true. Uh, the interference tube on a shotgun mic is designed to cancel out some off-axis frequencies and under specific circumstances could create oddities with reflected dialogue. However, in a small echoey room, cancellation and comb artifacts are already present regardless whether you're using a shotgun or not, and that's the real problem you have to deal with first. For example, if you're filming in the center of a tiled bathroom, it doesn't matter what kind of mic you use, your audio will suffer bizarre artifacts. Uh, as the reflections interfere with themselves naturally. So it's a bit lazy to simply avoid using shotgun mics indoors altogether. If the room is bad enough to cause problems with your shotgun, the room is also bad enough to cause problems, period. The first priority is always to make the location usable by any means you can. Hanging sound blankets or heavy towels in front of any reflective surfaces not in camera view makes a big difference. Even if you're on carpet, there's nothing wrong with laying an extra blanket on the floor, especially since traditionally we boom from above. At the same time, consider the placement of the mic and the talent within the space. Uh, moving just a few inches one way or another can have a significant impact. Um, the worst place you can possibly be is dead center between two reflective surfaces. If, after you've done your job, the mic you want to use isn't working very well for your situ situation, then by all means, switch it out. The real takeaway is that you should always have a plan for dealing with challenging locations. Get familiar with your equipment so you know how it behaves in different scenarios, and don't just take random advice from the internets. One more thing I'll mention is the difference between supercardioid and hypercardioid. While everyone would like for there to be an absolute definition, companies tend to use these terms at their pleasure. A standard cardioid from company A may be functionally indistinguishable from the hypercardioid from company B, and the pickup pattern may be different at different frequencies. So check the graphs that the companies post. They aren't completely accurate, but they'll give you the general idea. Case in point, if you look at the graphs for the AT4053B, which is a hypercardioid, versus the ME64, which is a cardioid, you see a couple interesting things. First, at lower frequencies, the two mics have almost the same pattern from 0 to 90 degrees. But oddly, at higher frequencies, the ME64 becomes more directional, while the 4053B becomes less so. High, in high frequency environments, like the outdoors or near electronics, uh, may favor the ME64. Also note that past a certain point, much of the difference between microphones is subjective. The MKH-416 hasn't stayed popular because it's objectively the best. The design is half a century old. Subjectively, however, it produces a sound that people like, and it's built like a tank. So, it is what it is. That said, the K6 system often gets a bad rep for some of its more subjective qualities. It's designed to be lightweight, so it feels cheap. It's less expensive than other Sennheiser options, so it's assumed to be low grade. But while the naysayers will say they're nays, uh, the fact is that each capsule for the K6 has a unique and useful quality. The uh, ME66, for example, is crazy sensitive and has a great noise floor, so despite having a 416, if I want to record sound effects, I'm probably grabbing the ME66. Recording on a porch during a light rain, the ME64 may deal with that high frequency noise better than the AT4053B. All of Sennheiser's mics tend toward a brighter sound, which, depending on the voice, may be good or bad. Other manufacturers, like Audio Technica, tend to go with a flatter response curve that uh, may bring out a little too much bass for some voices. And for you YouTubers, documentarians, and other independent artists and hobbyists, you may listen to the Lix Pro and think that it's bad because of the higher noise floor, but consider the difference that a 5 second noise reduction operation makes. I intentionally use noise reduction sparingly to avoid artifacts, but even at this modest level, you can make up a lot of ground versus the more expensive competition. Professional mics do exist for a reason, but for the rest of us, there's nothing wrong with getting 90% of the quality with 10% of the cost. Before I go, I wanted to try the ME65 in its intended position, along with the Audio-Technica AT2005 USB, which is a very popular podcast mic. 
like many vocalists, Mike, the 2005 is dynamic, requires a lot of gain, and is designed to operate within a few inches of the sound source. The ME65, as a condenser mic, is a lot more sensitive and has a wider frequency response range and competes favorably when put head-to-head -head against other leaders in this segment. Audio-Technica is a little cagey about the full specs of the 2005, but what most people agree on is that it sounds pretty damn good for a $45 mic. So good, in fact, that in the four years since I bought it, Audio-Technica has slowly raised the price to $79, and it's still a decent deal. The ATR2100 USB, which is the identical mic in a silver body, is $10 less. It does have USB for directly connecting to a computer, tablet, or phone, which is great for podcasting on the go. So for ADR, voiceovers, and podcasting, uh, you might consider one of these two options. The ME65 uh, is one of the better performers in its segment, and for $230 it seems like a worthy add-on if you already have the K6. Of course, you can occasionally find it on eBay for a whole lot less, as I did. So, there you go. Seven mics in the modest and moderately priced category for your consideration. We'll be getting back to camera stuff in the next video, so in the meantime, if you like this video and you want to see more like it, please hit the subscribe button and I'll see you next time.